Good morning, church. And welcome to worship today. It's wonderful to have the kids and Gap with us for the first part of the service. And uh, they're going to be sharing in the first part and they're moving off to their lessons later. So it's great to have you guys with us. And then we've got the Edge kids, uh, the Edge teens rather, with us for the whole of the service and communion. Can I just see by a show of hands, is there anybody who's here for the first time today? Anybody visiting for the first time? Welcome. <laughs> Wonderful to have you with us. We will be sharing communion later on in the service, and uh, all are welcome at the table of God's grace. I'm going to ask you to stand as we join together in our call to worship. And uh, this is a call to worship which is not just to be spoken like with your, you've just woken up, eh? Hey? You've got to shout out the responses, okay? So as we launch our preaching series, uh, focusing on the life of David, that is the focus of this call to worship. Who among us faces giants in our lives? Just as David faced Goliath with faith, faith and courage, let us face our challenges with trust in the divine. to conquer our fears and obstacles. In the story of David and Goliath, we see a small shepherd boy defeating a mighty warrior. Despite his size and inexperience, David had faith in the divine and the courage to confront his fears. What giants do we face in our lives? We face giants of doubt, fear, and uncertainty. Let's pray together. Oh, sorry, there's another line. Okay, like Davis, let us trust in the divine power within us. Will you repeat after me? With faith as our sling and courage as our stone, we face our giants unafraid. So God, we can face whatever challenges are in our lives without fear, and we can do so because you are the God who is with us. We acknowledge your presence in this place. And as we acknowledge your presence in this place, we open our hearts to your work within us as we lift our voices in worship of you today. Amen.
give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you. Ufanelwe imbeko nobubele Ufanelwe ludumo lonke Mdalwe zuku Sisepso nbako Ekseni tiklo weto namanda We thank you for this brand new day That you have blessed us with We thank you for being gather, For gathering here In your presence tiklo weto namanda Eka meni ilgaisu krestu Wase nazareta Father as we continue In our journey of faith mighty father Father, as we, and as we start this new series, learning from the life of David, a man after your own heart, Lord, help us to continue to face the giants in our lives the way that David faced the giants in his life. Help us, give us strength, mighty Father, and give us, mighty Father, the perseverance in everything that we are confronted with and everything that we face. Give us a tembeli chatiklo weto na manda. Ugutu sales bambili legu wenga matla shonge. Father, your mercies are new every morning, chiklo wetu. May they continue to fail afresh on us. And we feel chiklo weto na manda when your mercy is on us. Continue, Lord God, to be with us, Lord. Eka menil gaisu krestu wa se nazareta. Amen. He's 
So much that takes that feeling of hope away, Lord. There's so much in our nation, so much in our world that's, that's going on that can leave us feeling depleted of hope. God, I pray as people of faith, Lord, is that you would help us to see with your eyes as we look around in our own lives, at the people that matter to us, at the people all around us, Lord. 
Help us to live lives that declare that hope is real, that hope is accessible, and that you are the source of that hope, Lord. So let's just sing that quietly. Let hope arise. Let hope arise. Let hope arise. Let hope arise. Let hope. Let's sing a little bit louder. Let's declare that out. Let hope arise. 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 My hope is in you, God. I am steadfast. I will not be moved. I'm anchored, never shaken. Oh, my hope is in you.
Thank you for your miracles, Lord God. We are so grateful that you are who you say you are. You are the great God who loves us, cares for us. In you we hope, Lord God, you are our shield and our strength. We just love you, God, with all our hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Amen. Please take your seats. I wonder if there are any children in the house here. Why don't they come down and join me in the front? So we started our new series called It's Complicated. We'll try and make it as simple as possible. <laughs> but in general, relationships are complicated. Hello, how are you? Good, good. You can all sit down here on the floor. Do you want to sit there with the other guys? Good, we have a special story for you. The very first Lesson in It's Complicated. Someone said to me, where are all the children? And I see they just come from everywhere. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, I wonder if my guys have got our props. I'm looking for six volunteers very quickly. How about you? Did you put your hand up? You're yawning. How about you? <laughs> and you? And you? And you? You can come up to the front here. Uh, that's four. You can come as well, five, and six, great. Volunteers who just get up and do the job is awesome. Why don't you two come and stand on this side for me? Over there. And then they're going to hand you a puppet to hold for me, okay? Great, so we're going to look at the story this morning of hashtag giants must fall. Okay, so this is what happened one day in Israel thousands of years ago. This is a true story. You know that um, Bible words are true, don't you, boys and girls? Yes, you do. Do moms and dads know that Bible words are true? Yes, they do. <laughs> Good. So one day in the country of Israel, there was a battle about to begin but the battle had taken 40 days to get going. Can you believe it? The Israelites were standing on the one hill, camped there, and their great king, King Saul, which is this one. Old king Saul was tall. There you go. Was quite afraid. King Saul was too afraid to go to battle. So for 40 days, they sat camping on the one side of the valley. On the other side of the valley, there were some other people called the Philistines. They were the enemies of Israel. And the Philistines had this champion. Who knows what he was called? Yes. Goliath the giant. That's brilliant. This is Goliath the giant. You've got to hold him up high because he was over nine feet tall. Can you believe it? Nine feet tall. Oh, don't fall over, Goliath. Hold 
might want to put your other hand up high here. Yes, there you go. Very good. Well done. And the Philistines were camped ready for battle, but every single morning and evening, Goliath stepped down from the hill and walked into the valley, and he cursed the Israelites, and he ridiculed them, and he taunted them every day, and they got scareder and scareder. Even King Saul was hiding in his tent. Can you believe it? They were supposed to be the army of the living God, but they cowered in fear. But on day 41, something special happened. You know, 40 days is the number for testing in the Bible. Do you remember 40 days of the flood? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days. Moses was in the desert for 40 years. Oh, my goodness. And then this young man stepped forward. You can be him, okay. His name was David. He wasn't in Saul's army. He was visiting. He brought his brothers some food so they could eat. And he brought the officers some cheese, the Bible says. But David stepped forward and he said, I'm not going to take this from the giant. I'm not going to see God's people be ridiculed and taunted like that. So he stepped forward and he said to King Saul, I will kill the giant. Sure, King Saul was so relieved because he was the tallest man in Israel, the Bible says. And he was supposed to be the champion. On this side, they had the champion Goliath, who was over nine feet tall. On that side was supposed to be Saul. He wasn't as tall as nine feet, but he was afraid. So David stepped forward, and David was only a young man of between 15 and 17 years old. And David wasn't even a soldier. He was a shepherd. But David said to Saul, don't worry. I have killed the lion and I've killed the bear that tried to steal the sheep so I can kill this giant. Saul tried to put his armor on David and David, it didn't fit nicely, it was uncomfortable, it didn't work for him. So David said, no, I'm going to use my slingshot and I'm going to kill the giant with my skill, not the soldier's skill. So David went down into the valley and he met with Goliath. Goliath faced him. And they faced off, and David bent down, and he picked up five stones about this size. Can you believe it? It's about the size of a billiard ball, a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. And David put four in his pouch, and he put one in his sling, and he approached the giant, and the giant said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord, and this day you will fall down in front of the Lord. And David took his sling, and he swung it, and he let go, and the stone flew. Guess what? Almost 200 kilometers an hour, and hit the giant between the eyes. The giant fell down in front of David, face first. There we go, like an act of worship. Fell face first and fell, the Bible says he fell down dead. And the whole Israelite army were amazed and they rushed and they chased all the Israelites, uh, all the Philistines away. And Israel had the victory that day. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing story? God's people were saved by one person who had faith and trust in God. So right now, I want you to close your eyes. Father, we just thank you for all the boys and girls that are here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that they are learning to trust you and are learning about you and looking into your word. Lord, we just pray you move in their hearts and their minds and reveal yourself to them. We thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can give the puppets back. You can maybe put them on the side of the stage there. Give them a big hand. Well done, guys. And I just want to say to the moms and dads that you must be teaching your boys and girls at home the Word of God. The Bible says you must. God knows you must. 
and you should be doing it. And you can do it. It's not too difficult. It's like feeding them daily food. You just give them a little bit each day, every day, and they will grow into the faithful believers that God wants them to be. And anyone else who wants to join children's ministry and make sure and help kids to know God, you can meet me in the foyer after the service. Is that okay? Great. All right, I'm going to hand over to Zena. Boys and girls, you can go to your classroom, and then we'll see you later for communion. Thank you so much. Well done. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. It's always such a blessing to be able to worship with you all this morning. As we take up the offering, I am reminded of Psalm 55 verse 22, which says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Amen. We as a church are always so blessed to have the congregation and this community that gives so generously, and we are so thankful to God for that. The ways to give will be shown on the side screens, as well as there are QR codes behind your chairs, um, and there'll be offering baskets that'll be handed around by our ushers. Let us pray. God who's giving knows no end. We often get to say thank you because of what we constantly receive from you, Lord. In this moment, we want to say thank you as we give. In our giving, hear our hearts filled with gratitude for all that you are and that you have done. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Bless these tithes and offerings for your mission for this church, the community that surrounds it, and the plan for this country. We thank you for each and every single person who gives either with their money or their time, Lord Jesus. Bless Pastor Ian as he shares with us this morning, Father God. And may our hearts be open to hear your word, Lord. And may we feel each and every single thing that you say to us, Father God, today. May each and every single person see you, feel you, and hear you this morning. Amen.
Let's find out what's happening in the life of Grace Point. Lights, camera, action. Get ready for an epic night out. Call in all movie buffs and popcorn lovers. Mark your calendars because something incredible is happening on April 12th. It's Gen Now Movie Night, the ultimate cinematic experience for the young at heart. Join us from 6 to 8.30 p.m. for a blockbuster evening filled with laughter, thrills, and unforgettable moments. Picture this. Comfy seats, big screens, and an atmosphere buzzing with excitement. It's the perfect recipe for a movie extravaganza. So bring your friends, bring some snacks, and get ready to be transported into a world of adventure and fun. Whether you're into action, comedy, or drama, we've got something for everyone. Don't miss out on the movie event of the year. Join us on April 12th at 6 p.m. sharp. Grab your tickets now and get ready to make memories that will last a lifetime. Jenna Movie Nights, where the magic of the silver screen meets the thrill of community. See you there. For anyone who works with children, or even parents, and those who want to be a better storyteller, there is a training course on creative storytelling techniques for ministry on Saturday the 13th of April from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Grace Point. The course will teach you how to access your creativity and build a framework to use story techniques to teach the Bible to the next generation. The training is free, but please book your place for notes and catering purposes by emailing info at gracepoint.co.za. Talking to his disciples, Jesus said, Let's go by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. If you're in need of time away for reflection and rest with our Lord, then Sedibeng are holding a four-day retreat on the Grace Point property on Saturday the 20th of April from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This is a worthwhile experience and life-changing ministry. The cost is 380 Rand per person, which includes your material. Space is limited, so book your place soon by emailing info at gracepoint.co.za. The Bible teaches us that we are born in love, by love, and for love. But for too long, the Bible has been used as an instrument of domination and death. Let us change that. Join us as we take a fresh look at Scripture through the interpretive lens of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Manna and Mercy is a weekend retreat designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and will give you the tools with which to interpret Scripture in a way that leads to life. The course will be led by the Reverend Alan Storey at Grace Point from 6 to 9.30 p.m. on Friday the 3rd, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday the 4th, and finishing from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Sunday the 5th of May. The cost is 490 Rand, including catering and a manual. The weekend will be intense, but worthwhile. You can book your place or get more information by emailing info gracepoint.co.za. If you're new to Grace Point or visiting us for the very first time, then come along to the welcome desk after the service and we'd like to say hello and give you a little gift. You can also stay connected with us by adding your number to our WhatsApp Connect and you'll receive the latest updates on what is happening in the Grace Point community. All it takes is three very easy steps. Save this number to your contact list, 71 892-9382 Send us a hello. Follow the prompt you receive and you're connected.
Well, friends, we've had a wonderful time, not just of worshipping today, but also having the story of David and Goliath retold for us. For some of us, uh, the last time we heard the story was when we were little kids like these in Sunday school, hey? So perhaps it was helpful to have some of the uh, details of that story refreshed in our memory. So as we've seen today, we begin a, a six-week journey um, with one of the most well-known figures in all of Scripture. Did you know that with the exception of Jesus, there are more pages in Scripture dedicated to David than any other character? His story is told in great detail in in 1 Samuel and in in Kings. And uh, we learn more about David than any other person in Scripture apart from Jesus. One of the things that I love about the character of David is that he is such a rounded character. Those of you who are familiar with literature or film studies will know that you get two kinds of characters, don't you? You get the flat character, that person that is either all good or all evil, the goody or the baddie, okay? And then you get a rounded character, and with a rounded character, we discover that it's complicated, that the world is not actually divided into the goodies and the baddies, but that the dividing line between good and evil goes straight through every human heart. And nowhere is that more clearly evident, perhaps, than in the life of David. In fact, I'd go further than saying that the dividing line between good and evil runs through every human heart. And I would say that David's life shows the, the reality that The dividing line between good and evil is not a straight line, and there's not a sharp distinction between black and white, but that even in our hearts, there are these areas of gray where sometimes our motives are mixed. Sometimes we do what is good, but we're doing it with impure motives. Uh, Sometimes we do things with the right motives, but we cause great harm. To summarize in the title of our preaching series, it's complicated. Now, in your own life, you probably realize that you don't need to study the life of David to realize that life is complicated, do you? Because you experience for yourself that life is not as simple as black and white, good and bad, right and wrong, but that sometimes life is very, very messy. And yet, even in the midst of the messiness of David's life, God's grace is able to break into his life with incredible power, and, uh, and, and David is able to be used for good, despite all of the mess-ups that he makes. And so what we're going to discover in this preaching series is that as we explore uh, some of the key relationships that David has with other people, and also the relationship that he has with God, we're going to discover that that's how God works in the messiness of our lives. That as we allow God to work in our own lives, God begins to work with tremendous power and grace to work out his purposes not only in us, but also through us in the lives of others as we invite God into the messiness of our own lives. Now we've heard the story of David and Goliath, and we've heard Adrian reminding us that the the Bible is true, that the words in the Bible are true. But as we get into the series, we need to acknowledge that we've got to be quite careful with the way that we handle a story like the story of David and Goliath. The story that is filled with violence, the story which ends with David chopping off Goliath's head and then joining the army as they kind of chase after the the Philistine army and and, uh, Adrian softened the story a little bit. They didn't just chase away the Philistine army, but they slaughtered them and left dead bodies lying all over the field. And those Philistine soldiers, well, they were somebody's brother. They were somebody's son. They were somebody's lover. And those lives were taken. And the Bible tells us that they were taken in the name of God. And we've got to be careful how we interpret Scripture. Let me give you a very practical example from today about what I mean by this. Let's imagine... That uh, let, let's imagine a, a Muslim person, because Muslims also consider the story as part of Scripture. David is one of the major prophets in Islam. Islam, and let's imagine, for example, that one of the one of the uh, members of Hamas, 
who, who participated in that October 7th raid into Israel. And there was much bloodletting, a little bit like the story of David and Goliath. Let's imagine that that, that, that soldier said, you know what? Um, the story of David and Goliath inspired me to do what I did. You see, the people living in the Gaza Strip are like the David. We have been oppressed by the Israeli Defense Force over many, many decades. And so us going into Israel and doing the terrible things that we did, uh, we were going in the name of God to conquer Goliath. Now let's imagine that a soldier in the Israeli Defense Force, because the Jewish people also consider David to be one of the key people in their scripture and in their faith tradition. The very symbol of Judaism is called the Star of David. So let's imagine that this Israeli soldier uh, looks at what is happening in the Middle East, and the Israeli soldier says, you know what? Uh, Israel is the David, and the Goliath is the, those Muslim states around us who want to see the destruction of Israel. And so when I go in and am part of the genocide that is taking place in the Gaza Strip right now, I'm doing God's will because I'm David fighting Goliath. Can you see how careful we've got to be with how we interpret the scriptures, especially those scriptures that speak of violence and bloodshed? And there are many scriptures far more gory than this in the Old Testament. So what I'd like to do before we get into applying the scripture to our lives is to think about just this broader question that many people ask about how do we approach the, the violence and the bloodletting in the Old Testament when we claim to follow the Prince of Peace. And the first thing I want to say is that when we approach Scripture, we need to realize that the Bible is the, is the slowly unfolding revelation of who God is and how God works in our world. And that revelation only reaches its fullness in the person and in the teaching of Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. Some of you have Bibles that are called red letter Bibles. You know those Bibles, hey, where all of the words of Jesus are in red type. And that highlights the fact that we believe that, uh, that the full revelation of God is not a book. It's a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we see that God was slowly revealing himself to the people slowly unfolding, almost like layers of an onion, slowly being peeled away. And eventually the full revelation of God comes in Jesus Christ. So right at the beginning of the Bible, Yahweh is perceived to be a tribal God who is on the side of one tribe against the other tribes. And when we read those accounts of people, of God working, uh, this is how people understood God to be working. But that revelation of God contains some truth, but it was partial. And we see that there is, in fact, a progress in the understanding of how violence and revenge is to be understood in Scripture. Early on in the Bible, uh, we see that there is this problem of unlimited vengeance, which led to an ever-growing cycle of violence. So the way that unlimited vengeance works is, if you come and you kill my brother... I'm going to gather my clan, and I'm going to go and wipe out your whole family. And so you can see how violence just escalates when there is unlimited vengeance. And then in the book of Leviticus, we see that this law comes in which says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now that's a way of limiting violence. It says, if you kill my brother, I am entitled to go and kill your brother to avenge my brother's death. It prevents the cycle of violence from growing and growing and growing, but it never entirely wipes out violence. And then further on in the Bible, you get this idea that was prevalent at the time of Jesus, that when somebody commits evil against you, you should forgive them. And, uh, and the rabbis of the time spoke about, well, how many times should I forgive somebody? And at the time of Jesus, one of the teachings was that you should forgive somebody who sins against you seven times. After seven times, you're entitled to avenge what they have done. So there is this idea of limited forgiveness. And then comes Jesus. And what does Jesus teach? When one of the disciples come to him with this, he says, well, 
you are to forgive 70 times 7. And so Jesus introduces the idea of unlimited forgiveness. And, and, and this is the full revelation of God's response to violence and revenge and warfare in our world. So we come back to the story of David and Goliath, and we say, well, if, 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 if Jesus preached uh, nonviolent resistance to evil, if Jesus was the Prince of Peace, then what are we to do with the story of David and Goliath? Should we just rip it out of our Bible and throw it away and say that it's not part of Scripture? Well, that's, that's certainly not what we should be doing. I remember some years ago, I had a spiritual director, and I would meet with my spiritual director once a month. And he would help me to deepen my walk with God, my life of prayer, my reading of scriptures. He would give me homework to do that I needed to do and then report back on when I met with him in a month's time. And one time he said to me, Ian, I want you to begin to read through the Psalms in your devotions. I want you to prayerfully read one Psalm a day and to make the words of that Psalm your own words to God. And I was excited about this because in my mind, the Psalms were filled with these beautiful words of like, adoration and praise for who God is and for how wonderful God is and for the stars in the sky and the birds of the air and so forth. But I very quickly discovered that I, when I did that exercise, that many of the Psalms, uh, yes, there are those Psalms, but there are also many Psalms in which the psalmist cries out to God and says, God, will you, will you slaughter my enemies? Will you deal with my enemies? I'm being pursued by evil and wicked men. Uh, will, you, will you avenge? Will, will you deal with them? And I came back to my spiritual director the next month, and I said, what am I to do with this? I mean, I'm not being pursued by anybody. I'm not being chased by anybody. And I don't really think that God is out to deal with the people who have got it in for me. And he invited me to, to read the Psalms, and many of whom are attributed to David, to read them metaphorically. And when I, I read about the enemies that were threatening my life, I was perhaps to think of the, the, the things which were robbing me of life in all of its abundance. For example, the deep desire that I had to please people around me all of the time which was leading me to say yes to every request that people made of me, uh, leave, leaving me burning the candle at both ends and almost burnt out. That desire to please was an enemy which was pursuing my well-being. And I needed God to heal me of that so that I could be guided by uh, what God was calling me to do in deciding what I could, should say yes to and what I should say no to. And so do you see how when we read a story like David and Goliath, we can consider, well, what are the giants that we are facing? And so right now, I want to invite you to think about what are the giants that loom large over your life right now? What are the giants that, uh, that overshadow and block the light out of your life? What are the things that seem too big for you to conquer or to overcome? We've got, uh, we've got uh, the edge uh, teenagers in our worship service today. Maybe for some of you it's matric. Eh? <laughs> Maybe matric seems like a Goliath. You've got those mid-year exams, and then you've got uh, the prelims, the finals, and it just seems overwhelming to you. Or maybe the, the Goliath in your life is the depression or the anxiety that you're battling. Maybe the giant in your life that needs to be overcome is, uh, is the state of your most important relationship. Or maybe it's the state of the nation that we are living in right now, and it seems like the problems that face us are overwhelming. And so as we think about what the giants are in our lives, I just want to very briefly offer you four things that we can learn from David's response to Goliath that can help you and I as we confront the Goliaths in our lives. And, uh, and the first thought I want to offer to you is this, that we overcome our giants when we shut our ears to the naysayers. When we shut our ears to the naysayers. So in the story of David and Goliath, uh, 
uh, Adrian explained how David comes with food for his three older brothers who are in the army. And whilst he's there, Goliath comes out, and David begins a conversation with some of the other soldiers in the camp, asking what's going on. And we can see that the cogs are turning in David's mind, and he's beginning to think about how God might use him in this situation. And this is what his older brother says to David. I'm reading from 1 Samuel 17, verse 28 to 30. We read that when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave the, those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now, what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? And he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. Now, I want you to think about those times where you have been criticized. And isn't it true that some of the most painful criticism to deal with is when people criticize the motives behind what we do. We do some things with the best motives in the world. And then like Eliab, somebody says to us, you are wicked, you are conceited. And that criticism cuts deep. And some of the most difficult criticism to deal with is the criticism we get from our own family, from those closest to us. Many of us have, old, I've got an older brother, and uh, I think for most of my life, my older brother has been kind of like my hero that I've looked up to. And, you know, what he says, I just put extra weight to. So here is David's oldest brother, like accusing him of the worst things. I wonder, I wonder if there wasn't a moment where David thought, ah, you know what, I'm just going to get back into my lane. I'm going to go back to my little flock of sheep, and I'm going to do what I'm going to need to do, and I'm going to leave it up to this cowardly group of soldiers to deal with Israel's future. And then at least I'm going to be out of the line of criticism. But David refuses to do that. He is sensing that God is calling him to step out in boldness and faith and courage. He refuses to listen to the naysayers even when it is his own brother. And there are some of us, friends, that know what God is calling us to do. And we need to block our ears from the voices of the naysayers. And even where we hear their criticisms, we need to not, not pay heed to them. The second thing we discover from the story of David and Goliath is that we overcome giants when we focus on the sling in our hands rather than the shadow the giants cast. When we focus on the sling in our hands, rather than the shadows that the giants cast. Let's pick up the story now, where David's been talking to the soldiers. Word has got back to Saul about the conversations he's been having. And so Saul summons David to appear before him. And, and we read from verse 32, that David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. That's a courageous thing to say. Let no one lose heart. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul replied, You're not able to go out against this Philistine and, draw, and fight him, for you are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion and a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. So David is looking beyond who Goliath is, and he's looking at the sling in his hand, and he's remembering what God has done through that sling. As he has been practicing for hours and hours in the wilderness, Throwing, uh, slinging stones out of that sling and hitting rocks and then eventually hitting lions and being able to kill them, David realizes that the sling in his hand can be used to defeat Goliath. Yesterday, I had the, what felt to me like the misfortune of having to attend a district 
budget meeting. An hour's drive west of here. And, um, and, and I was asked to give a lift to one of the members of that meeting. She's, uh, and the conversations that we had in the car for an hour there and an hour back made that very boring meeting worthwhile. Because next to the car, in the passenger seat of the car as we drove, I got to know a beautiful saint that some of you might know from Bryanston Methodist Church called Toko. And the sling in Toko's hand was her career in banking. She had started out in banking and eventually climbed her way up to be the branch manager of a bank in this area. And when she retired, there was a need for somebody to offer leadership at Akani School, the primary school that we run in Dipslut on our church property there. And she gave the first three years of her retirement to being the, the, the manager of the Akani School. And she spoke about the wisdom that she brought from the lifetime that she had spent in the banking industry, the equivalent of David learning to kill the beasts and protect the sheep. And how she, she invested that in, the, in a turnaround strategy for Akani School. Uh, her management experience, her organizational development experience, her financial experience, her, her, uh, her, her human leadership skills. And it was just so exciting to hear somebody who had looked at what seemed like an overwhelming problem. A school of 500 learners in one of the poorest areas of our city. Um, uh, facing many, many challenges, but she took the sling in her hand and she refused to be overwhelmed by the giants before her. And friends, I, I want to say to you that, uh, that there are many of us who are called to do the same, to say, what is the sling in my hand? And how is it that God might be using me to overcome the giant that stands before me? The third thing we learn from the story of David is that we overcome giants when we take off the armor that other people try to dress us in. When we take off the armor that other people try to dress us in. Let's pick up the story with the conversation between Saul and David in verse 38. We read that then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he wasn't used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. And so he took them off. And then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistines. Now, friends, I think that there is a powerful lesson in this, that we are most effective for God's kingdom when we are true to the people that God has created us to be. There are so many people who spend their entire lives feeling that there's something wrong with who God has created them to be, and therefore they, they try to be somebody that they're not, mimicking this person or that person. And the reality is that you're never going to be that person as effective as that person can be. The only person that you can be with great effectiveness is who God has created you to be. And so part of following Christ is the journey of discovering who you are in Christ and how God has wired you and what items of clothing and what weapons you need to be carrying with you into the world. And that was the lesson that made David as effective as he was. Earlier this week, I was driving our youngest daughter, Emma, to school, and I was in a bit of a city mood. We were waiting at the traffic lights. Uh, there were cars all around us, and my favorite song came on uh, on the radio, and I started dancing like in the car and going crazy. And Emma looked at me and said, Dad, please. She was desperately looking around to make sure none of her classmates were in the car sitting around her uh, and uh, putting her head like this. 
And then after a while of shaking her head at uh, her dad, and let me say that I'm, I'm very proud of this because it's part of a father's job description to embarrass their teenage children. Isn't that true, eh? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm glad I can get an amen to that. She said to me, you know, Dad, whatever. You, be, you do you. You do you. Have any of your kids ever said that to you? You do you. And, and you do you was a kind of way of saying, Dad, you're weird. <laughs> But I guess you just do you. And she was saying it in good humor. She was saying it tongue in cheek. I'm grateful for that. But I was thinking about that phrase, you do you. And there's a sense in which that's what God says to every single one of us. Now that's different to the message the world sometimes gives, which says that you must just follow your whatever desires you have. We know that there are godly desires and there are desires that are not godly. So we've got to think carefully about what we mean when we say, you do you. But God says to us that we fulfill our purpose on this world, in this world, when we, when we discover who we are in Christ and when we begin to live into that reality. There's a wonderful story that you've probably, I may have shared with you before, comes from the Hasidic tradition of Judaism. And it's a story of Rabbi Zussia who dies and he arrives at the pearly gates and he's feeling anxious about the way that he's lived his life as he's waiting in the queue. He's thinking, well, have I, have I been holy enough? Have I lived a righteous life? Uh, is God going to reprimand me? And he imagines God saying to him, tell me, Rabbi Zussia, why weren't you more like Moses? Or why weren't you more like Solomon? Or why weren't you more like David? And finally, the time comes where Zusia appears before God, and God says something quite different. He says to Rabbi Zusia, he says, tell me, why weren't you more like Rabbi Zusia? And I think that's something that we all need to think about. And then next, friends, can I say that we overcome the giants in our lives when we trust in God's power working through our skill? We trust in God's power working through our skill. I read from verse 45, and I'm not going to read the entire scripture, but just verse, just verse 45, where, where David says to the Philistine, he says to the Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so there is this, this wonderful sense in which David trusts that as he comes before Goliath with his slingshot and with his stones, and as he uses the skills that God has given to him and who God has created him to do, that God is able to take what he offers and is able to do exceedingly above and beyond what he could ever have imagined. My uh, son, who is, um, who is uh, studying down at UCT, uh, has been playing FIFA on his PlayStation for many, many years. And uh, sometimes as parents, Holly and I would think, this is a waste of time. Alex sitting in front of the TV when he could be outdoors doing more wholesome kind of things. But what Alex discovered recently is that some of the guys that he's been playing PlayStation with are doing esports at university. One of his friends is at Stellenbosch University and is in the, one of the top players at Stellenbosch University. And Alex said, I'm as good as him. So he signed up for esports at UCT. And he is discovering that he's doing very well. And, and there is the sense in which this thing that he has been doing all of his life he has suddenly discovers that when he uses it uh, in the esports league at UCT, that actually he can go quite far. Maybe this is just me boasting about my kid, but maybe there's also a lesson in this, that sometimes we bring the stuff that we think is not going to be of that much value, and when we bring it and when we offer it to God, God is able to just do incredible things through us. So as you think about the giants that face you 
that face your loved ones, that face our nation, that face our world? Could it be that the only way the world is ever changed for good is when faithful people bring what is in their hands and who God has created them to be and say, I'm going to step forward and come apart. And as we each begin to do that, God's kingdom begins to come on earth as it is in heaven. Now we're going to transition straight into communion. And isn't that partly what the story of last weekend, the story of Easter is about? The story that we remember every time we share in Holy Communion. It is the story of Jesus who took on the mighty Roman Empire, who took on the corrupt religious forces of his day, who took on all of the forces of sin and darkness, and he was true to who he was. He walked the way of love, even unto death on the cross. He refused to turn away from, from loving these people and these people that people wanted him to stop loving. He spoke up for who they were and for their dignity, and he was killed. He was nailed to the cross for his troubles. It seemed like he was David, coming with nothing more than a slingshot and stones in his hand against the mighty army of the forces of evil. And yet God was able to use Christ's obedience to bring about the salvation of all the world. Now the kids are coming into the sanctuary, and uh, as I'm speaking, I'm going to invite the parents just to kind of raise your hands and uh, connect with your kids. But as we prepare to, to move into Holy Communion, let us remember, friends, that what Jesus did for us on the cross is just a, an example of what we are called to, how we are called to be used in the world. And that David's offering of himself with great courage is a foreshadowing of what Jesus offered for us on the cross. So let's pray together. Loving God, as we hear the children coming into the sanctuary to share in our family meal, as we prepare to gather at your table, we are reminded, Lord Jesus Christ, of the foolishness of the cross. We are reminded how you offered nothing but obedience to the Father, and yet that offering was used to slay the giant of sin and death forever. And so as we share in that saving power, we offer ourselves to be used by you. Where we are afraid, will you fill us with courage? Where our sight is just, our focus is entirely upon the giants before us, help us to see beyond that, to what you have placed in our hands and who you have created us to be. And help us to trust that as we offer ourselves to you, that your spirit can work in us and through us in surprising, miraculous ways. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite those who are assisting with communion to come and join me at the front. And as they are coming forward... Uh, just a reminder to any visitors that you are welcome to this table of grace. Uh, we come in humility and in faith. And will you please stand? So friends, today we remember that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
God, I pray that you will send down your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us your body broken and your blood shed. Send down your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord Jesus, as we seek to be your body, willing to be broken and shed with the hurting world. For we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended. Amen. Won't you be seated? And as we share in communion up front here, if you just remain in a spirit of prayer as you prepare to come to the Lord's table. I invite you to draw near with faith. We invite you to approach down uh, these two aisles here and to receive the bread and the wine. If you'd like to go kneel in the alcoves and pray afterwards or even kneel um, on the steps here, you are welcome to do so or just return to your seats and be in prayer. If you can, those in the middle blocks can return to your seats up the middle aisle and those in the outside blocks, if you can return up the side walls. And let's, uh, as we share in this meal, Let's remain in that spirit of just receptivity, of re receiving God's grace as we experience it in the sacrament. Will you draw near with faith?
Friends, shall we pray together? Loving God, as we go out into this week, we thank you that you have fed us with your grace in this meal. And so we go out strong in the knowledge of who you have created us to be and ready to take what it is that you have placed in our hands and to journey forward in courage and obedience. Amen. Friends, before we share the benediction, just to say that uh, next weekend is our Kairos uh, prison weekend uh, just across the road here at Yukop. And so we're needing help. Uh, if you enjoy baking, then uh, we are needing biscuits. Uh, no nuts in the biscuits, although nuts are welcome to do the baking if you want to, if you categorize yourself as that. No nuts in the biscuit. There's the dad joke that makes my daughter roll her eyes at me, hey? Okay, you can bring biscuits, uh, if you can bring them by the 9th uh, to Grace Point, we can make sure that they go with the team to Leocorp. We also want to invite you to be praying during this week and especially over weekend for the Kairos team, for the staff uh, at Leocorp and for the prisoners that are going to be a part of the program. And then if you'd like to support the work of Kairos uh, financially, the account details are on the screen. And we invite you to donate by EFT. Won't you stand as we speak God's blessing into each other's lives and as we receive it into our own lives. And so let us say together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.